king and the Lord of their life. Just like you and I, as we continue our study, today we want to look at uh, lesson number 14, entitled The Furnace of Affliction. I'm sure after hearing the title, you're glad you're here. Uh, this is a hard lesson, but yet it's going to end victorious. So just, I, I hope this lesson will do for you what it's been doing for me the last week as we look at the furnace of affliction. In Psalms 34, 19, there's a passage that we're basing this lesson on. Many are the afflictions of who? The righteous. Here's your promise, though. But the Lord God will deliver us out of how many of them? All. Many are our afflictions, but he promises to deliver us out of them all. In Exodus 3, last week we were talking about the beginning of the mediatorial kingdom that God is going to establish on earth, and Moses will be the first mediator. So God's getting ready to establish that kingdom. And in chapter 3, Moses is at the burning bush, and what does God say to him? I have certainly seen the affliction. I see all the oppression that my people are suffering in Egypt at the hands of the Egyptians. And he says, now I hear the cry of their heart. They're crying out to God because of the slave masters and the affliction that they are enduring. And we go back to Exodus 1 to see what that affliction was. And in chapter 1, verse 11, it says, They, meaning Egypt, they put slave masters over the children of Israel. Why? They want to oppress them with forced labor. And the children of Israel even built two cities, storage cities, they were called, for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is a type of whom? The devil, Satan. Okay. Now, what happens? He says it was to oppress them and to put heavy burdens upon them. It goes on in the next verse, and it says, The more they oppressed the children of Israel, what happened? They multiplied, and they were growing and spreading, so that the Egyptians, the enemy now, is fearful of them because no matter what they do to them, it just seems like they grow and they spread. And it says in one translation, the Egyptians become terrified of the Israelites because of how God is blessing them. So what did they do? Now they're going to work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter, and they put harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So that's the affliction that God is hearing. And in verse 8 of chapter 3, this is what God tells Moses. I am now, I'm coming down because I am going to deliver them from the domination of the Egyptians that is upon my people. And he says, listen to this. I'm going to bring them out of that land. And he said, I'm going to take them to a good land, that promised land. It's spacious. It will be theirs. I will be their God. I will give them victory over all of their enemies. It's this land flowing with milk and honey. And he says in verse 10 of chapter 3, Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I see the way that the Egyptians are treating the people and oppressing them. So now I want you to go, Moses. I'm sending you. And he said, you are going to go to Pharaoh, and you are going to be the deliverer of the people and bring the Israelites up out of Egypt. And when they cross the Red Sea, as he takes them over to Mount Sinai, God will now be setting up that first mediatorial kingdom on earth with Israel as his people, and Moses will be their mediator. If we look in Isaiah 48.10... It says, Behold, or look, I have refined you. Is God in the process of refining you and me? We are his people. We are the called out. I'm refining you not like silver. Let this passage soak into your heart. I have chosen you where? In the furnace of affliction. That's where he is choosing us, in the furnace of affliction 
to purify us and to make us more like Jesus Christ. The word affliction in some translations will say oppression, and in some it says humiliation. But what does it say? I have chosen you, not in the place of ease and tranquility, because many times when things are going very smoothly in our life, what is our relationship with the Lord like? It's not what it needs to be a lot of times. We get in our comfort zone, we get a little bit apathetic because things are going really well. He says, he doesn't choose me in the place of ease and tranquility. He says, I've chosen you where? In the furnace of affliction. Let that sink into your mind as we go through today's lesson. So I believe that right now, this life that I'm living, it is a training ground. Remember, we are in boot camp. We are being trained to be what he wants us to be one day in his kingdom. You and I are being trained and proven right now. Our life now, I believe, greatly impacts what our life will be like when we leave this body and then we will be with him, receive our glorified body and be with him in his kingdom. So you and I, we're going to come up for evaluation. And that's what this life is all about. He is preparing us to serve with him in his coming kingdom. So let's look at this furnace of affliction and look at some bullet points about it. Point number one. I believe the afflictions that come upon the godly, you and me, they are divinely appointed. These afflictions we learn as we go through Scripture, it is not the result of fate. It is not the result of whim or mere chance. Job 5, 6 says they do not arise out of the dust. They don't just come up out of nothing. It goes on to say these afflictions, you are not to be traced them to a secondary cause. It goes on to say they are not merely the work of my enemy. It says these afflictions come how? By God's wise, divine providence. He has different afflictions for you than he does for me. True? But he's working in all of us with the end goal that all of us become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, our faith being tested to see if it's genuine. What do we do when the hard times hit? We're being tested now to see what, we, what position we can have in his coming kingdom. In 1 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, here's what Paul told the church at Thessalonica. So that none of you will be shaken by all these afflictions that you are seeing, you know we have been what? We are destined for this. This is part of the, our destiny as a child of God. We are going to go through the furnace of affliction. Micah 6, 9 says we are to heed the rod and heed the one who prepared it. We all are going to suffer trials, tribulations, testings. Some get in fiery trials. We all are going to experience them. If you're not experiencing them, what does the Bible say? You need to check and make sure that you are a child of God. He says, because they will come. Now, that's something for you and I to consider. All of God's children, all of us, we either have been in a furnace of affliction, we are in it now, or we will be in it. That is a given fact according to God's word. Let's take a quick trip through the Bible. Y'all ready? Put on your seatbelt. We're going to go rather quickly. We're going to start with Adam and Eve and see how God's children were always in a furnace of affliction. It began with Adam and Eve. And remember, when they were first created in the image of God, they fellowshiped with God, he walked among them, and there was no such thing as sin. True? They had a perfect environment. But due to the fall of man, when Satan entered the garden and Eve succumbed to the temptation and then Adam willingly took... They lost dominion, and sin entered into the world. So they lose dominion. They are taken out of the garden. Now they have two sons, but it's not long before what happens. One son rises against the other and murders his own brother. I would say, us as parents that have children, 
you know what a furnace of affliction that would be in your life for that to happen in your family. And what happened? They find one day one of their sons is nothing but a lifeless corpse. And this is the son that has been the one that was obedient and following God himself. But that Cain's enmity, Abel became a victim in the furnace of affliction because of Cain's enmity and his jealousy and his rebellion against God. So time marches on, and now where are we going to find God's child? We come unto Noah. Noah preached for what? A hundred and twenty years. Did he have many converts? No, and he's out building a boat on dry dock. He's building this huge ark. He was laughed at. He was hissed at. He was called a fool and a simpleton because of what he was doing. Had they ever even really seen rain? No. And so people do not understand, and they just think he's an old fool for everything that he's doing. He's the, in the furnace of affliction of slander and ridicule. How about God's children of Abraham? furnace of affliction when God says I want you to what sacrifice your own son Isaac and Jacob we know they all had many different trials and tribulations sometimes deep in the furnace of affliction if we move on in history where we are now in Exodus where are God's chosen people they're in the kilns in the brick kilns of Egypt being persecuted and oppressed if we move further in history, and they're now out of the Red Sea, they've had their covenant at Mount Sinai, now they're in the wilderness. And what does God send them in the wilderness? He wants them to see, I am all you need. You don't need anything else. I am everything you need. And so out in the wilderness, what did God do? He sent fiery serpents among them. They are out day after day, baking under the hot sun of the desert during the daytime. They can't find food, but God miraculously supplies it, does he not? And when they need water, he also performs miracles. He gives them their basic needs, but he wants them to see, I am all that you need. How about during the time of King Saul? Where was God's child and faithful servant David while King Saul is uh, in charge and in control? David is hiding in the caves of En Gedi. He's fearing for his life. He's living out there with no sustenance except what God will provide for him. So he's in the cave. When I went to the Holy Land in the year 2000, we were walking along a road, and they pointed, and right over there they said these were the cliffs in En Gedi where they figure David was hiding in this area. We know from Scripture that King Saul at one point took 3,000 men to go hunt down one. And he takes 3,000 men, he sends them out there, it says, to the rocks of the wild goats. So you can see the terrain that David was living in for all this time. Something that I just want to throw out that just popped in my head. David, God said, when he was just a young teenage boy, what did God tell him? You're going to be the king. You're going to be the king. So it was God's purpose that he would be the king. But was it going to be years of living in the caves, years of being tested and tried before he became the king? I'm going to throw this out. Has God said that you and I, he's purposed that we will be a king? Has he? Yes. Are we being tested and tried to see if we are fit to become what he purposed that we should be? No different than David. He said, you are a king, but you're going to be tested and tried till it becomes a reality. Okay, God's child later on. Oh, we're now in the period of Ahab and Jezebel. Where are God's prophets? Where are they? Oh, Obadiah has all hundred of them, and where are they? Living in the caves. He put 50 in one cave, 50 in another. In case Jezebel's people found these 50, they would at least have these left. And what's Obadiah doing? Feeding them bread and water. That's where we find God's children. 
we go a little bit further into history and we see Elijah, the, the one that everybody thought was crazy, running around in his shaggy garments. And where do we see Elijah? God had him go to the brook Cherith, and remember he was out there alone, and God had ravens come and feed him. He lived a very isolated life. And then the brook dried up, and where did he send him? He said, you go to the widow of Zarephath, and she only has a little oil and a little meal, and she will be the provision that you need. If we move on into Isaiah and Jeremiah, they were treated very cruelly. Jeremiah, remember, they threw him down into a well to leave him to die. Where's Daniel? Daniel found himself in the lion's den. But we know that God did a miracle there. But God's people continually, as you go through all of history, you find God's people faithful servants in the furnace of affliction if we move into the new testament think about the apostles that were persecuted many of them had cruel deaths they were beheaded they were tortured they were hung up they were crucified upside down god's servants have always been tested in furnace of affliction during the time of the church of thyatira during the dark ages there were about one million christians who were killed on orders of different popes. Spurgeon says, the march of the army of God can be tracked by, you see the little tracks? The tracks of their ashes. Many of them burned at the stake, burned alive. They were roasted in those bronze bulls, if you remember from the church of Smyrna and Pergamos. The ashes that they have left behind. Spurgeon says the church has left behind blazing fires of persecution and trouble. The path of the just is scarred on earth's breast. Monuments of the church, if you've ever gone to Europe and you see many of the monuments in all the old cathedrals, many of them are nothing more than the sepulchers of the martyrs. God's people have always suffered in the furnace of affliction. Spurgeon goes on to say, The earth has been plowed with deep furrows wherever they have lived. And he says, You will never find the saints of God where you also don't find the furnace burning around them. So are we also destined to be tried, to go through all kinds of trials and tribulations as we are on our proving ground right now? You and I are no different than the people in the Old Testament. We're no different than the martyrs that have laid down their lives. So a wise person will be able to see the grace of God in the hand of God in the good times in our life and in the bad. Is it all from him? He has stuff that he appoints, and he also has a permissive will, true? So we see the hand of God, whether it's in an affliction or whether it's in our good times. Every event in my life that's allowed to come into my life and yours, it's a divine appointment from him or it's from his all-wise permission to let it come in. In Ephesians 1.11, it says, God's working all things after the counsel of his own will. So number two, we've seen that they're divinely appointed or they're God's uh, permissive will in my life. Number two, why does God want to put his child in this furnace and provide afflictions in their life? I thought this was most interesting. I hope you find it so. We look at the stamp of the covenant so we're going back to Genesis and see God's unconditional covenant that he made with Abraham. Now, for a document to be legal, even today, does it normally have to have some kind of a stamp, a notary stamp or something, some seal, to make it legal and binding? So this covenant that God made with Abraham, we're going to find there were two stamps. So we want to look at those. Now, you remember God's going to do an unconditional covenant with Abraham. It is nighttime, and it says the horror of darkness comes upon Abraham. Does it tell us that God put him in a deep sleep? Yes, it does for this unconditional covenant. If you see on the picture here on the screen, 
Abraham had done everything he was told. They were to take different animals, and what were they to do? They were to kill them, and then they cut them in half, right? And normally during the ceremony, the two people that were making the covenant with one another, they walked through the pieces in like a circle eight. So both of them would do things to verify that they're coming together in this covenant. However, where's Abraham? He's asleep. God put him to sleep, and God's going to do the walking for both of them because it's an unconditional covenant. So that's what's going on here. There are two stamps on this covenant. One of them is a burning lamp. What's the other one? It's a smoking oven or a smoking furnace. Let's look at this just a little bit. When I saw the burning lamp, I immediately think of Psalm 119, 105. It says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my path. Does it show you the whole thing? No, it shows you like a step at a time. So you are guiding me. This is part of the covenant. You promised to lead and guide me, be a lamp unto my feet. Where did we see this? When they're crossing the Red Sea, what's going before them always? the light that God has provided, the Shekinah glory of him. And then when they build the tabernacle, every time they set it up out in the wilderness, what's there? That light, the guiding light is there leading the way for them. But also with that covenant, there was a smoking oven. There was a smoking furnace. And it says that also was part of the covenant. So Spurgeon asked a very interesting question. Should I ask God to free me of the smoking furnace? How many of us, when we have trials and tribulations, what do we want? I want out. <laughs> I want out. Spurgeon says, should we ask to be let out of the smoking furnace? He says, absolutely not. Our attitude is, oh God, what do you want to teach me? What are you trying to do to me? What lessons am I, is it that you need to teach me? What graces do you need to teach me? Your life needs to be manifested to others. That, that victory that we can have, that everlasting peace that we can have, maybe you need to use me to manifest that to those around me who are trying to find it, who are seeking it. He said, don't ever ask to be taken out of the furnace. God's doing a mighty work in you. He said, and that would invalidate the whole covenant. What was the covenant? I'm your light. I will guide you. I will be with you. But there's also a smoking furnace, a smoking oven. He says, don't ask to be taken out of it. Spurgeon says, therefore, will I cheerfully bear it since it is absolutely necessary to render the covenant valid. There were two stamps. The light to guide us, he will be with us, even in the smoking furnace. I thought that was very interesting. So, why else does God want to put his children in this furnace of affliction? If you look up here, you can see the old gold mines and the cars that uh, they used, and they would go in, and they were trying to get the gold out of the mines, remember? Or maybe you have even panned for gold. Have a lot of you done that, taken your grandchildren or your children, and you pan for gold like up in Alaska? And so when you get these little nuggets of gold, they really are not worth much. Why? They're full of impurities. They're not in a usable state. Precious things have to be tried. They have to be put into the fire. And we see that the dross has to be removed. Do you see how this is becoming a liquid? They put it in the fire, what? So it becomes pourable, so it becomes in a moldable state. And when it's done, what product do you have? Pure gold. I want to be gold at the judgment seat of Christ. I want to be gold at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in Proverbs 17 at 3, it says, The refining pot is for silver, and the furnace is for gold. But the Lord is testing what? Our heart. Is my heart truly devoted to him? Am I really have a heart for God and his will to be done in my life? All things of any value are going to have to be tried where? 
Where? In the furnace, in the fire. Now, he says, if you were nothing but a piece of tin, there would be no need for this process in your life. It's because you're valuable to God. He's wanting you to be molded into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So at the judgment seat of Christ, you come forth as gold. Remember what Job said? Though God slay me, yet I will trust him, and then I will come forth as gold. So it's because we are valuable to God that he tries us in the fire. He's wanting us to be conformed into his image. You remember the song that we have sung several times? Just think of the words in your mind and look at the pictures. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. He's going to have to put me in the fire. He will have to. And what are the words? Melt me, then mold me. Do you see it's being poured into a mold so it has a certain shape? Then I want you to fill me and then use me. That's the whole process that's going on right here. Now, number th three, number two, why else does God put his child in the furnace? We are to be a sacrifice to God. You know Romans 12, 1? Daily you present your bodies to Jesus Christ a what kind of sacrifice? <coughs> Living sacrifice. And every sacrifice has to be burned with fire for it to be acceptable. I want you to look at this. This was very interesting to me. In the Old Testament, did they not have to kill a lot of animals? They did. But even if they took that, that bullock and they killed him and they put him on the big pile of wood and they're getting ready to offer him as a sacrifice, the sacrifice is not acceptable until it's burned and consumed. They could take... You see the picture here, they had to burn it. The sacrifice had to have the fire put to it. And then they could take the lamb and slit its throat. They put it on the big pile of wood and they say, this is our sacrifice to God. But until it was burned and consumed, it was not acceptable. We are offerings, the living sacrifice to God. Is that true? We are. And some little trial or thing comes up in our life and we want out. We don't understand why God's putting it on us. And there are many different reasons why he leads us into different trials and tribulations. But I am to present myself daily as that living sacrifice. And it says, if I never had the fire of trouble, if I'm constantly trying to get out of it, if I never let it come and I'm never kindled, I'm going to lie there like that animal on the wood without smoke and no flame and I'm unacceptable. That sacrifice is not acceptable to our Father. It says, because I am his sacrifice, the Bible tells me I must be burned. All sacrifices had to be burned. God puts his child in these different situations. And without the furnace, I would not be at all like Jesus Christ. Every time he puts me in the fire through some kind of a trial or tribulation, is he not trying to mold me into the image of Jesus Christ? He wants soft pieces of clay. He wants us pliable. Otherwise, we will not be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In his description that John gave on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 1, here's what John said. The feet of Jesus were glowing bronze, refined where? In a furnace. Did Jesus go through a furnace of fire? He absolutely did. It says, if he walked through the flames, must not I do the same? I am told to take up my cross and follow him. True? I am to, he is the example, and I am to follow in his footsteps. That in all things, Jesus might be like unto his brethren. Now... How many of us are looking forward to our glorified body? I'm going to be like Jesus. Boy, can we get excited about that? I'm going to have a body like his. I'm going to be with him. He's going to be the king, and we can get all excited, can't we? If I can get real excited about that, why is it that we don't get excited and we are fearful here 
for him to change us into his image. I want to be like him there. Oh, but being conformed to be like him right now, it can get painful, can it? We have to go through a lot of different trials and tribulations before we actually are conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Spurgeon says, Will I not follow his footsteps? Am I willing, no matter what trial he asks me to go through, am I willing to follow in his footsteps, humble myself before him, be that soft piece of clay so he can mold me into his image and thank him that he cares enough about me that he wants me to be made like Jesus Christ because he desires every one of us to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Spurgeon says, onward, you Christian. The captain of your salvation has gone through that dark valley before you. Has he gone through and experienced everything you and I do? He, led, he had victory over everything. If I want victory, I need him to be that light. I need him to be the lamp, to follow, to guide me, to be with me in the trial. But it also, not only did it have the lamp, it had the smoking oven. They go together. He says, onward, you have boldness, you have courage, and you have hope that you may be like your Savior. We are called to be just like Jesus Christ and to participate in his sufferings. Now, a lot of us want to participate in the good stuff. I want to participate in his glory, don't you? I want to share of that inheritance and participate in the glory. But now we're to be participating in the sufferings, in the fellowship of his sufferings. Romans 8, 17, I think it's listed wrong on your paper. It's 17. This is a verse we ought to memorize. Now, if we are children, are y'all a child of God? Yes. If we are children, I'm an heir. I am an heir of God, right? We all are. And we're a co-heir with Jesus Christ. Wow, that's wonderful. Because Jesus is, re is going to receive everything for his inheritance. Go to Psalm 2. Do you see the word if? We are co-heirs with Christ if we share in his sufferings so that we also will be able to share in his glory. We need to keep that emblazoned on our hearts. Now, I'm an heir of God, we all are. But this is saying, essentially, are the rewards going to be the same for everyone? No. If I want to share in that glory, I share and participate in the sufferings now. And the word if is there. That's something we ought to look at. Now, let's look at the design of this furnace. The design of the furnace for you and me is for our benefit. Now, we may not see that, and I am a testimony that I scream stomping and pulling away from everything he sent in my life. I thought everything was a punishment. Why have you put me here? Why aren't you bothering somebody else? And I went through the whole gamut of emotions, except here I am. Use this situation to teach me until finally, about getting close to 10 years ago, the Lord finally broke me, and he began to teach me that all of these things are for my benefit. And what a difference when we respond correctly like the Word tells us to instead of whining and complaining and all of those other things. So the design of this furnace is beneficial. There's a guy named Robert Hall who says... We should be more anxious that my afflictions benefit me that the, than that they should be speedily removed from me. I want to learn what it is God wants to teach me in every trial he gives me. Now, I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago, but I do now. And it's the passion of my teaching that we all come to that place that we see these are for our benefit, that God is trying to use them to mold me, to mature me, because he wants to say, well done. And he wants to see each one of us conform to the image of Jesus Christ. All of these 
things that come into my life that God either divinely appoints or he allows. They're for my everlasting good. Everything he's doing to transform me, to mature me, to grow me, will have everlasting impact. And also, it's for his glory. Now, when I'm in, a, in a, an affliction or some kind of a trial, and people all around me hear my complaining, and they see me in depression, and they see me not responding correctly, God's getting no glory, is he? No. They're wondering what my problem is. And nobody wants to be around you because you're complaining all the time and rehashing your circumstance. However, when that same circumstance comes in and you have yielded to the Lord and in your relationship, His peace is being expressed through you out to other people, is He receiving glory? That's part of the purpose of our afflictions so that the character of Jesus Christ can be made manifest to those around us, not only to unbelievers, but to our fellow sisters and brothers in the church, in Christ, so it can be an encouragement, just like that cloud of witnesses. Remember chapter 11 of Hebrews? And chapter 12, verse 1 says, You're surrounded with this cloud of witnesses. They were sawn in half. They lived in caves. They... They were persecuted and suffered all kinds of stuff. And what are they saying to us? We did it. You can do it too. And you do it by running the race with G being surrendered to Jesus Christ. So it's for my everlasting good and it's for his glory. What is God trying to do to Francine? Grow her. Become, make progress in your spiritual growth. Don't stay immature for 50 years. Grow up in Jesus Christ, into the fullness of Jesus Christ. Richard Sibes has a quote that I thought was very interesting. He says, the winter is preparing the earth for spring. We all understand that. We have to go through winter, which I do not like at all, so that we can get to spring. He says, your afflictions, if they produce sanctification in you, he said, it's preparing your soul. For glory our afflictions can be for our benefit when we respond correctly and prepare us for eternity uh, Hebrews 6 1 Paul says therefore let us move beyond all these elementary teachings about Jesus don't we all love to hear that God loves us Jesus died on the cross we have a home in heaven those are the basics he said, get off of that stuff and move on to maturity. Learn about being a sacrifice. Learn about following in the footsteps of Jesus, being conformed to his image. Number two, all these afflictions, the psalmist says, they prevented me from going astray. In Psalm 119.67, it says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I'm learning to observe your word. That's a scripture that has meant a lot to me because before severe afflictions came into my life, I was here all the time, but I was not in a relationship with him. And I was pursuing sanctification and the strength of my flesh and all my activity. And then he says in verse 71, it was good for me that I was afflicted so I could really learn your ways. Have you prayed and asked God like David did? Teach me your ways. Show me your statutes. Get into the Psalms and pray those things over yourself. These afflictions are meant to wean us from this evil world, so I don't want to stay here. I'm a, I'm a what here? I'm a pilgrim. I'm not supposed to be setting down such deep roots here. It says in Psalm 66, 10 through 12, I love this passage. You, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. We went through the fire and we went through the water. But what did you bring me to? A place of abundance. I went through all that stuff and finally with the right attitude surrendered to him, he brought me to that abundant life that I had been searching for about 40 years. Where's that abundant life? I hear about it. I read about it. People talk about the abundant life and I couldn't find it but through the afflictions that he brought into my life when I turned to him and surrendered to him, 
He's brought me to that abundant life. And I've tasted it, I've experienced it, and I don't want to let it go. He goes on, he says, Egypt was the furnace of affliction for the nation of Israel. True, they were oppressed and treated miserably during that, and it caused them to cry out to God. It made them turn to God and be willing to follow his statutes. We go back to our prodigal son. Where was he? He was enjoying himself until he ran out of money and all his plans. He had plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. And when he went through all of them and none of them worked, and he's eating with the pigs, what does he think of? Home. He thinks of home, and the Father is there waiting to take him back. God does not want us to be so... Uh, enamored with this world that we don't want to leave it he wants to make this world a grief to us and he says so that we would not make this our paradise this is not to be our paradise now afflictions will test our religious profession we all say that we are surrendered to god i believe him i believe he's everything i need we all can say those kind of things in Job, he says, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me and tested me, I shall come forth as gold. How many of us can say, I'm in the Lord's army. I am a soldier in the Lord's army. He is the captain, and I am just willing to serve him, willing to go anywhere that he takes me. We all can say that, can we not? And the Lord is my banner. He's my shield. He's my everything. Well, I believe that's why sometimes he begins to allow attacks on us. Do, does my heart really follow what my mouth is saying? He allows attacks on me, and what is he doing? We learn in the Scripture, our faith is being tested to see if it's genuine. Do I really believe? Will I really stand on what my mouth is confessing and saying? Now, some in the Lord's army, what happens when the first little trial of affliction comes their way? They are out of here. They are gone AWOL. And they want to escape, and they are gone. Many of them will become a traitor. It was a false confession in the first place. And where are they? They have joined the enemy. But many will be able to stand. The only way you and I can stand when, those, we're, in, when we're in the furnace of affliction is if we are, have that relationship with Jesus Christ and we're surrendered to him because he's the one that gives the victory and he's the one that will cause me to stand. Without him, I won't be able to stand. So we cannot boast in anything we do. We only boast in what Jesus Christ does through us and in us. 2 Timothy 2.3 says that I am to share in the suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ I'm in his army and you've heard me say many times when you're born again you're drafted into his army and you're a private I do not want to show up at the judgment seat still a private y'all understand that it says we are to share in his sufferings that's part of what we have been called to here in this life he also wants to grow us in the Christian graces. In Hebrews it says, now this is Romans, we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? When I suffer, what is it going to produce in me? Endurance, that perseverance. And in Hebrews 12, 1, what does it say that I need to run the race of faith? Endurance. I need perseverance. Where am I going to get it? From my sufferings. The suffering produces the endurance or the perseverance in me. And then the endurance begins to per, uh, produce the character of Jesus Christ in me, and then the character will produce hope in me. God afflicts me with these severe trials to produce his graces in me so that I run with endurance. I'm developing the character of Jesus Christ, responding biblically to all my trials and tribulations. Otherwise, I have it all inside of me when I'm born again, right? It could lie dormant there for years, never used. He wants to develop these graces in me of his victory, his peace, his endurance. The furnace is used to stir us up to pray. What does your prayer life get like when you're in the furnace? We all know the answer to that. 
Isaiah 26. He says, Lord, they came to you when they were in distress, and they poured out their secret prayer to you when the chastenings were afflicting them. Wow. Maybe that's why I felt like I stayed in the furnace a lot for quite a few years. He kept trying to drive me to that relationship and the prayer life to be what it needed to be. It says, Jesus will be with me in the furnace, though. Is that a good thing? He is with us there in the furnace. He comes to all those desolate places. There were times in my life I felt like I was the only one that was suffering these afflictions. And I know I'm not, it's just that a lot of people don't talk about it. But have you ever felt like you were the only one God was picking on? <laughs> be honest. Okay. And he comes to those desolate places to be with me. Spurgeon says, As sure as God puts his children in that furnace like he did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who's in there with them? He is. If he puts us in there, he will be with us and he will equip us to be able to stand. The grace of God. Are you amazed at God's grace sometimes? It's overwhelming. He says, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God and I will strengthen you. I will help you and I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. I know many of you have found that to be true in your life during your trials and your tribulations. He says in Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through those waters, I'm going to be with you. When, you. when the rivers overrun you and when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned and the flame shall not hurt you because he will be with us. In Hebrews 12, 11, this is a great passage for you to remember. Underline it. Hebrews 12, 10. God disciplines us for our what? Our good in order that we can share now what in his holiness. He wants us to share in his sufferings. Now he wants us to share to become holy like he is. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. True? Boy, is that a true statement. But it seems painful. But he has brought it because he wants us to partake of his holiness. We're partaking of his sufferings. We're partaking of his holiness. We're partaking of his character, of the example that he set before us. Because someday he's going to say, who's going to participate in my glory? And I feel like these are prerequisites. He says, later on, however, if you let it do its work in you, it's going to produce a harvest of righteousness and peace. Have you been in the furnace and found peace that you couldn't explain? I have. And he says, look at the last sentence. Look at the last few words. The peace and the righteousness comes to who? Those who are trained by it. Are you letting it do its work in you? You have some promises you can bank on if you will allow it, and you're trained by it. You learn from it. The afflictions prepare us for greater usefulness and greater fruitfulness. These afflictions flow both because he's compassionate, he loves us, but he's also what? A God of justice. He's just in his dealings with us. In John 15, 2, it says, He will cut off every branch in him that's not bearing any fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so it will become more fruitful. So what do we see? What precedes my growth? Pruning. And then if I bear a little fruit, what does he need to do to me so I bear more fruit? Pruning. <laughs> It's just this cycle over and over, pruning and growth and pruning and growth and bearing fruit. Now, Spurgeon says the right hand of God's mercy knows exactly what his left hand of severity is doing. Does he promise he will not put more on us than we are able to handle? And the more we learn to rely on him, can we not handle more when we see he's everything that we need? in that trial and tribulation. 
In Deuteronomy 4.20, this is a scripture that's going to wow you. The Lord took them out of Egypt, and he brought them out of Egypt out of that iron-smelting furnace. He took them out of the furnace of affliction. Why? To be the people of his inheritance. Jesus Christ, are we his inheritance? We are his bride. He wants to, us to be the people of his inheritance. He wants us to come out of the furnace of affliction to be the people of his inheritance. That here, well done. God is fashioning me right now and you. My inward spiritual life, he needs pliable clay. Are you yielded to him so he can pour you into the mold of Jesus Christ? And he has to heat us sometimes to get us pliable, to make us more like Jesus Christ. He's fashioning that on me right now and you. What's he fashioning us for? Crowns. Has he purposed that I will be a king and a priest in his kingdom? He has purposed it. And he is grooming us now. He's testing us, trying us, putting us to the fire to mold us into the image of Jesus Christ. Crowns and thrones and positions in his kingdom. So all the oppressions that I'm going through, all the piercings, all the anguish, all my disappointments, that furnace of affliction that I find myself in, they're preparing me for a position in his kingdom. He's preparing me to be a person of his inheritance. He's preparing me to be his bride. That's what he's doing with you and me right now. So when we can see the grace of God in our life, it will enable me to see the hand of God in all the events that he allows to come into my life, and I can begin to bear all these afflictions without murmuring and without complaining. What does it say in Chronicles? I can't think of the exact verse. What does it say? God's eyes are searching over the whole earth. Is he seeking people whose hearts are fully devoted to him? And he says, I can do a mighty work in them. He's looking for people who he can manifest his power in. Searching for people whose hearts are devoted to him. Look at Job. He lost everything, but he consoled himself. In Job 23, he said, He performs or will complete everything he's appointed for me, and he has many things in mind for me. That's what Job said. Think of David. King David suffered from his family. He had sufferings from his enemies and even his friends. And what did David say in Psalm 31? My times, O God, they're in your hands. My life is in your hands. And I love what David said. I'm going to zip my mouth. He says, I remain silent and I do not open my mouth because God has allowed it into my life. He says, you're the one who acted. If we look at what Samuel said to Eli, the, the high priest, he said, Eli, your family tree is going to be cut off. What was Eli's response? He said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. My mouth is not murmuring. It's not complaining. When uh, Isaiah went to Hezekiah, he said, Hezekiah, some of your sons are going to be taken to Babylon, and they are going to be eunuchs. And what did Hezekiah say? The word of the Lord you have spoken is good. So when you and I, have you ever been in this place? You're in a furnace of affliction, and you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. It just seems dark and oppressive, and you don't know how it's ever going to turn out for good. What do we have to rest on? Because I know all of you have been there. We can all probably call several times where we have felt this way. And Jesus told them, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. He's working all things for our good, right? who are called according to his purpose. And what's his purpose in verse 29? He has predestined that we should be conformed 
to the image of Jesus Christ. So the trials that come your way and mine, they're not just the mere product of whim or caprice or fate or chance. I am not the victim of some empty, vexatious circumstance, even though I felt like a victim many times in years past. I'm a child of the king, are you? We are children of the king, and right now, he is fashioning us. We are to be pliable clay on that potter's wheel. We, are, we should be willing to be poured out, into the, made into the mold of Jesus Christ. Pressure is going to come. Pressure will come. We are called to suffer. And we are going to go through several scriptures. I call these my attitude verses. These are the attitudes that I need to have about suffering. And we go over and over them. In 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21, it says, But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for something you did wrong and you endure it? Because you deserve that one. You did wrong, and you got the beating. He said, but if you suffer for doing good, and you endure it, this is commendable before God. You patiently endure it. And watch this. It says, you have been called for this purpose. To suffer for good, and patiently endure it. You've been called for that purpose because Christ suffered for you he left you an example to follow in his footsteps 2 Timothy 3:12 all who live godly look at the next three words what does it say in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution in Philippians 1:29 it says to you it has been granted. You have been given the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but you've been given the privilege to suffer for his sake. We need to keep that in mind. In Acts 5, it says when they left the council where they had been raked over the coals, it said they departed from the presence of the council and they rejoiced because they were worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. These are verses that I, I have me a list of them and I go over these often. Finding joy in my fiery trials in 1 Peter 4. It says, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning this fiery trial that is sent to try you. As if some strange thing has happened to you. I am not unique, although I used to think, why am I getting picked on? But rejoice to the extent that you are able to partake of his sufferings now. Why? So that when he comes and his glory is revealed, you will, suffer, you will also share in his glory. There is a reason for these sufferings that we're going through right now. James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face a trial, all kinds of trials. The testing of your faith is going to produce what? Patience. You need that patience and endurance to run the race well in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. So the testing of my faith will give me that patience. And it says, God is using all these tests. He wants to grow me. He wants to mature me. And let perseverance finish its work so you'll be mature, so you'll be complete and not lack anything. And then when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, you won't be one of the ones ashamed and empty with nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 9, it says, In this you're going to greatly rejoice. Now, when you see that phrase, what do you automatically do to find out what this is? You have to back up. In this, I'm going to greatly rejoice. So we're going to back up a couple of verses. And here's what I'm rejoicing in. Verse 3. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth. I am born again. And he said, you have a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is that not something to rejoice in? That's what we're rejoicing in. 
And he goes on and he says, Rejoice because you have an inheritance that is imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, and it's being kept in heaven for you with your name on it. Rejoice in that. That's what I'm rejoicing in. And it's being kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So those are the things I'm rejoicing in. And notice this phrase, a salvation that is going to be revealed when? In the last time. Now, I've taught this many times. My spirit is born again, true? I don't have to worry about it. My body's going to have a glorified body someday. What is in the process? I have been saved. I will be saved. We went over this. What is in the process of being saved right now? My soul, my mind, my will, and emotions. How is it doing? It will be revealed at the last time. At the judgment seat of Christ, that's what's on uh, up for review. Not my spirit in the body. It's my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. So he says, and these are the things we're rejoicing in. But right now, for a little while, if need be, you're going to have all kinds of grievous trials. Why? It's the testing of the genuineness of your faith. There it is in black and white. And it's more precious than gold that has to be tried in the fire. And you want your faith, when he comes back, to be found to give praise, honor, and glory when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's the genuineness of my faith that is being tested. And he goes on in verse 8. Though you have not seen him, do you love him? Yes, even though we've never seen him. And though you do not see him, you believe in him, true? And we rejoice with a joy that we can't even describe. And we are filled with glory. And what is the goal of my faith? What's the goal? The salvation of your soul. It is in the process of being saved. Through all the trials, the tribulations, that fiery furnace, are we being changed into the image of Jesus Christ? God is looking for people to step into a place of ministry that have an effective testimony. But they have that effective testimony because they went through a furnace of affliction usually. And God's looking for those people. He wants to fit his workers properly, and he usually will have to plunge them into the fire, into that afflicting furnace. And it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when Paul realized that, remember he had the thorn in the flesh, and Paul suffered a lot. And God finally told him, my grace is sufficient for you because my power will be made manifest in all of your weaknesses. So what did Paul say? I'm going to boast all the more gladly about all my weaknesses because when I'm weak, who's strong? He is, and God's power rests on me. That's an amazing statement. God chooses his workers, remember, in the furnace of affliction. We saw that at the beginning of the lesson in Isaiah 35. And he's fitting people together for a higher ministry when they're in a place of distress. He's fashioning, he's choosing people in the furnace of affliction to give them a higher ministry, but it's usually in a place of affliction where he chooses them. Psalm 4.1, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. This is a great statement. You enlarged me when I was in distress. You gave me a ministry, you're giving me a testimony, you enlarge me in a time of distress. He enlarged me when I was in distress, and I believe I have a testimony that's effective because of what he did to me in the furnace of affliction. He strengthened my faith, and it took many years, but I finally saw the result. And through the prayers and God changing me and bringing me uh, to be more molded into the image of Jesus Christ, and all of you have been with, many of you watched me through the whole process. And God did a major work, not only in me, but in the life of Laura. He was working on her when I decided it was time to work on me. And I took my hands off of her. Spurgeon says, The Lord gets his best soldiers 
out of the highlands of affliction. And y'all know this is probably one of the first passages I ever, ever used when I taught. It's one of my favorites. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore, I'm not going to lose heart. It means I'm not going to react badly, improperly. Though outwardly I am wasting away, inwardly I'm being renewed day by day as I stay in the Word and my relationship with Him is number one. It says, does all the suffering that we're going through right now, no matter what it is, what does Paul say? It's light. It's also temporary. And when you can see, oh, all these, this furnace of affliction that I've been in, what is it doing for me? It is producing, it is working for me a weight and glory that far surpasses anything I've ever gone through. And he says, so set your focus on eternity and focus on what you cannot see. Remember, we're going for the prize. We are soldiers. We are in the race. God has a purpose for everything he allows into our life. And we need to rejoice in all the stuff that we have. Look forward to that and keep your eye on the prize. And it says in Hebrews 12, 2, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus because he's the pioneer, he's the perfecter, he's the completer of my faith. And listen to this. He's our example. For the joy that was set before him, Remember, he has an inheritance coming. God is taking out a family for him, a bride. For the joy that was set before him, he was able to endure the cross, and he despised the shame, and now he sat down on the throne by the Father. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you Lord, my heart is really full this morning because your word gives us such encouragement that all the things that you put us through are for our good. And Lord, what's waiting for us, what you have prepared for us is beyond anything that we can even comprehend. May we stay focused. May we keep our eye on the prize. May we have the right attitude about the trials and the sufferings that come into our life. May we draw closer to you and yield to you, become that pliable clay that can be poured into the mold to be, to be made more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.